You've probably heard it. You'll lose performance. You'll lose power. You'll lose strength. You'll lose endurance. You won't recover. You're underfueling your training. For years, fasting and time-restricted eating have been bashed when it comes to performance. They were wrong. And honestly, if performance was only about calories and glycogen, that criticism would make sense. But that's the part that most people are missing. Because new research is starting to show that performance isn't just about how much fuel you have, it's about how your cells are programmed to use it. And a new line of research is revealing something that we really didn't appreciate before. When you eat, changes how your muscle cells generate energy in the first place. In fact, one of the most striking studies to date, literally just shifting the eating window without adding training, significantly improved exercise performance, particularly endurance performance in this case, but we'll talk about it a little bit more. And it wasn't because of weight loss. It wasn't because of extra carbs. It wasn't because they were leaner and able to perform better, but it was because of how feeding timing interacted with their circadian clocks and the mitochondria. And that changes the entire conversation around fasting and performance. So here's where we're going. I'm going to walk you through the study that really sparked this and why it surprised a lot of people. It actually even surprised me in some ways because I knew that fasting could improve performance anecdotally in my own experience, but seeing it on paper is pretty cool. Then we're going to break down the mechanism that's underneath all of this. We're going to talk about the circadian mitochondrial connection that almost nobody talks about. And finally, we'll look at where the human data fits, who this could actually help, where the limits are, and how you can pragmatically use it. So let's start with the study that changed this whole narrative. This was a study that was published in Nature Metabolism, okay? And it looked at something very specific. It looked at time-restricted feeding, not as a diet, but as a biological signal. And if you watch my videos a lot, you know that I talk about fasting as like a signaling tool. Okay, so it was cool to see a study looking at it like this. The researchers used mice. Yes, I know it's rodent model, but hear it out. Okay, the mechanisms are solid. It split these mice into different feeding schedules. One group ate freely whenever they wanted to. One group followed time-restricted feeding during the day. And then another group followed time-restricted feeding during the night. Same calories, same food, no exercise training, just different eating periods. Then they tested endurance using treadmill running and voluntary wheel running. Ready for the result of this? The mice that were on daytime time-restricted feeding doubled their endurance performance compared to both night-fed and freely-fed mice. No calorie differences, just when they ate. Okay, let that sink in for a second. No training, no extra fuel, just feeding time. Now, before anyone freaks out on it, Mice are nocturnal, okay? This does not mean that you should eat at night. What it tells us is something much more important, and that's that feeding time itself acts as a powerful signal to the body. But here's where it gets particularly interesting. The researchers didn't stop at performance. They wanted to know why this happened, so they did something very clever. They used mice that had specific circadian clock genes knocked out, these genes called pair one and pair two which I've talked about probably at nauseum in other videos. Okay, these genes help coordinate timing signals inside the cells. So when those clock genes were removed, the endurance benefit from the time-restricted feeding completely disappeared, which tells us the most fundamental critical thing here. The circadian clock wasn't just involved, it was required. So people that bash fasting saying it doesn't do much for circadian cues of timing, ha. <laughs> In other words, time-restricted feeding was improving performance by reprogramming cellular energy metabolism through the circadian system. So let's slow this whole mechanistic thing down and translate it, okay? The researchers found that daytime time-restricted feeding better synchronized what they called a mitochondrion-centric circadian network inside the muscle tissue. That network controls things like fatty acid oxidation, which definitely plays a part in performance, your branch chain amino acid metabolism, so how much muscle you break down or don't break down. It also regulates mitochondrial energy output. Simply put, the muscle cells became better at generating energy over time. And here's where it gets hairy. Out of all the genes involved in mitochondrial function and lipid metabolism, only one gene consistently responded to daytime time-restricted feeding. That gene was one called PLIN5. PLIN5 sits right at the intersection of fat storage inside muscle, fat mobilization, and mitochondrial energy production. So think of PLIN5 like a traffic cop. 
It helps decide whether fat just sits there or if it gets efficiently delivered to the mitochondria to be burned for energy. It is a regulator. When PLIN5 is expressed correctly, muscle cells can access fat without shutting down glycogen use completely. That is a big deal for endurance or just any longer term exercise over like an hour. Because one of the fastest ways to fatigue is burning through glycogen quickly and then losing access to fat. Another reason people fatigue is obviously going to be a hydration thing. You hold water when you have glycogen. So for every one gram of carbohydrate you hold, you hold about 3.7 grams of water. So hydration is critical here. So if you're maintaining your glycogen, then that kind of works out where you can maintain performance and intracellular hydration, right? I also put a link down below for Element, which is the electrolytes that I recommend. Whenever you're doing any kind of workout, whether it's fat loss or power or whatever, hydration is going to amplify everything. So that link down below gets you a free sample variety pack of the electrolytes that I use. So I recommend you give them a shot. They've got some really cool things rolling out here soon. They've got their stick packs. They've got their sparkling beverages. All of these are literally five calories or less. They're sweetened with stevia and they're 1,000 milligram sodium, 200 potassium, 60 magnesium. So that link, again, gets you a free sample variety pack with any purchase. Check out Element at drinklmnt.com slash Thomas. Now here's where the dots start connecting with some of this stuff. You might be thinking, that's mice, okay? We know that mice respond differently, kind of. But what about humans? That's a very accurate and fair question. And we don't have perfect human version of that exact study because things start in mice and then they go to humans. But we do have a very key human clue. And it comes from a study that was published in the journal of Clinical Endocrinology and Metabolism. And it looked at intermittent fasting and calorie restriction in women in this particular case, but it would probably be the same in men. And they measured changes in skeletal muscle lipid metabolism. So how fat was oxidized in the muscle. They weren't measuring endurance. They were measuring gene expression, and one of the standout findings was that intermittent fasting increased PLIN5 expression, meaning it produced more of this, in human skeletal muscle. Same exact gene, different study, same direction. So now to be very clear, this does not prove that fasting improves endurance in humans in the same way, all right? But it does suggest that fasting is altering that same intracellular machinery that's involved in fuel handling. So in simple terms, fasting and feeding timing appear to change how muscle cells organize fat for energy use. And endurance is just one place that that shows up. And when I say endurance, this doesn't mean everyone's running a marathon. This means your ability to have stamina throughout a workout. It's not going down when you fast. I can almost put money on that unless you're draining the heck out of your body. So now that we've covered this mechanism though, I want to look at the actual performance data in humans so we have more evidence to really like, I don't know, combat the naysayers. So there's a study that's published in the journal ISSN. Okay, this looked at elite cyclists during four weeks of high-level endurance training. This is more specific endurance work, right? One group followed time-restricted eating with an eight-hour window, and the other one followed a traditional meal schedule, so they weren't fasting. They measured VO2 max, uh, body composition, inflammation markers, and of course, performance. And here's the honest result that they come up with. There was no significant improvement in performance tests in the elite athletes. That matters, okay? We don't hide that, but there were some really important side effects. The time-restricted group lost body weight. They lost fat mass but they maintained their lean mass. They showed signs of reduced inflammation. And here's the kicker, their power to weight ratio improved. Here's the real nuance. Elite athletes don't have much room to improve their VO2 max. Okay? Their system's already dialed in. But for recreational athletes, for people carrying extra body fat, for people dealing with recovery issues or metabolic inflexibility or a regular aging person, that's where this gets interesting. And there was a study in PLOS1 that looked at men with different body compositions, higher fat mass versus higher lean mass. And they compared the aerobic performance between these two groups. They found that excess body mass, whether it was fat or muscle, reduced relative aerobic capacity. What this means is that carrying extra weight makes endurance harder. Okay, not rocket science, right? So if a time-restricted feeding helps reduce fat mass, without harming lean tissue, it may indirectly support endurance, especially, especially in non-elite populations. So before we close this loop, what about strength? 
because people are fasting and working out, right? Well, there was a study that was published in Nutrients that looked at resistance training combined with, once again, fasting or time-restricted eating. They found no difference in muscle mass. But interestingly, lower body explosive performance favored traditional eating, while upper body strength favored time-restricted eating. That's kind of funny. It's not a slam dunk either way, but it tells us something pretty important. It's that time-restricted eating isn't inherently catabolic, okay? It's not just magically destroying muscle. It's not even just inherently destroying muscle. And it doesn't universally harm performance. It shifts the adaptations. So let's circle this all back, okay? The takeaway here is not that fasting magically makes you a better athlete. In some ways, I kind of think it does, but that's my own anecdotal claim, okay? The claim I'm trying to make is more of a simple takeaway. It's that feeding timing is a biological signal not just a caloric decision, okay? It interacts with your circadian clock, it reprograms mitochondrial fuel handling, and performance is one of the first places that those changes show up. So endurance just happens to be the canary in the coal mine and the stamina, right? So how do you actually apply this without harming performance? Like, what do you do? I would say first, if you're gonna start to experiment with this, you want to start with a daytime eating window, right? Something like late morning to early evening. This lines up a little more closely with circadian signaling and kind of avoids the mistake of pushing food like too late at night. And then secondly, don't stack this with aggressive calorie restriction. The benefits here were not about eating less. That's really important. Okay? They were about when the calories showed up. So keep protein high, keep total intake reasonable and high enough if you're training hard. And then if you do train hard, place your training inside the eating window, not at the far end of a long fast, okay? Now, that's gonna have a place if you're trying to burn more fat. Training at the end of a fast is fine, okay? But if performance is your goal, you might wanna have it either inside the eating window or towards the early part of your fast and actually take the period after your workout to continue the fast. You won't break down muscle. You don't need to eat right after your workout. You will be fine. This way you're like putting yourself in a mode where you still have like a little bit of fuel on hand. But honestly, the adaptation makes the poison. Once you're adapted, you can probably do it whenever. Now, the last thing is you do have to give it some time, right? Circadian adaptations don't happen in a few days. They do at a certain degree with like pair one and pair two, but you have to think in terms of maybe days and weeks, not like individual workouts. You have to remember that you're retraining biological clocks, right? So you're, you're trying to actually shift the whole thing so you get better. And then if performance drops, that is kind of some feedback, all right? This video isn't dogmatic. I mean, I love fasting, but I'm going to be real. You do have to kind of like pay attention to your performance. If things wean back or if things dial down, then you may want to adjust the timing or kind of pull back or maybe add some more calories. Okay, the goal is better energy availability, not forcing a protocol. So do what works for you. But when you really do look at the big picture, this research changes the conversation, right? Fasting and time-restricted eating aren't automatically bad for performance. They don't automatically improve it either. What matters is how they interact with your biology. And we need to stop saying that it's wrong to fast if you're performance oriented. I can say and go on record because I'm filming with him, George St. Pierre, one of the greatest fighters of all time. He does these long three day fasts and still would fight and still would actually train like that. And he's one of the best conditioned athletes in the world. Okay. Some would say he's an outlier. Some others would say he's adapted to it. Okay. So for a lot of people, the real benefit isn't even the performance output anyways, the metabolic flexibility, the better fuel switching, the lower inflammation, the more stable energy, the potentially better recovery. When you get to these like really elite levels, they may need precision and like tighter fueling windows, but most recreational athletes, you're going to gain so much by improving body composition and improving your recovery and lowering inflammation without sacrificing lean mass by doing some fasting that it just might be worth it. And most importantly, this really isn't about eating less. It's about eating in sync with your biological rhythms and performance doesn't come down to like how much fuel you have immediately. It comes down to how your cells are programmed, your overall fuel load over the course of days, not the individual day. So if you're more interested in the fat loss side of fasting, especially visceral fat, I broke that down into a separate video. This video looks at a specific fasting approach that led to significantly greater reductions in specifically visceral fat, actually 33% less. So I linked out to that video here. I recommend you check that one out. It might teach you a new way to fast now and then anyway. So as always, keep it locked in here and I'll see you tomorrow.